going on last week that's the reason why i wasn't getting up but uh this morning we back to it with some more history and we're gonna talk about a couple subjects we're gonna talk about the kingdom of kush and uh it's a bbc special we're gonna talk about 50 it's a 50 year old debate that we was having 50 years ago about police brutality uh and the history of new york slave trade and then we're gonna do something on the mississippi you know what i mean so Let's start with this police debate just to get the morning started, yo. Give me your comments. What up? What up? Here we go. Good morning, yo. The grand rise. And talk about they never heard of police brutality. They don't know what black people are talking about. They can't prove it. We know in Detroit, anytime a black person is uh, brutalized by the police, he goes into court and he's arrested for assault and battery. Now, the basic Clear, issue the is so simple, and nobody will even touch it because you're afraid to touch it. You are deliberately trying to evade the issue. Everybody. Is <laughs> Reverend Plague, uh, Reverend Plague, if you can hear me. Right, of course they're gonna give y'all commercial early in the morning. I would expect it, but yeah, this is, we starting out this first video is the debate from the 1950 about police brutality, and um, and I want to show you how much how, how nothing much has changed. Here we go. between black people and white people. You don't want to say it. You don't want to hear it say it. You want to talk to somebody else. You got a nut sitting there someplace who says he's a police official who hasn't said one thing all night. There is a power struggle going on and black people have decided they're not going to tolerate oppression any longer. Now, police brutality is a very deliberate thing. It's a part of American life. America has decided that black people are to be kept in subjection. It's an army of occupation that the white power structure keeps in the black ghetto. We know, now don't talk about they are, they are, how what is the internet? Uh, Reverend Plague, uh, Reverend Plague, let me ask you a question. Knows it. White people know it throughout America. White people know what white policemen are doing. Let me ask you a question, Professor uh, Reverend Clay. are not going to permit police brutality to go on. Reverend Clegg. City in America. Reverend now, Clegg. In almost a hundred cities, race violence last summer. <laughs> if police brutality continues, we'll have it in 200 cities next summer. Now, white people know that. Something has got to be done about it. We are wasting time. We are waiting. Let's come to the issue. I Black can't seem to get Reverend Clegg's ear, and without Black seeming to see, to seem irreverent or disrespectful, we're going to shift to Philadelphia, where the chief of police of Detroit is in uh, the Philadelphia studio, uh, Chief Bassell. Uh, yeah. Can you uh, can you add something? Uh, to this dialogue, Mr. Parcell, yes, you're the I'm president, not... I believe, of the Detroit Police Officers Association. Are you on leave from your duties as, uh, as chief? I'm not the chief of police. I'm the head of the Police Officers Association. I stand corrected. Please go ahead. I'd certainly like to answer the Reverend Clegg. I think there has been a many uh, self-appointed leaders uh, throughout the Negro community who has stated that they represent the Negro. And I think it's a proven fact that in these areas where 
they had a vote for police officers, and I read in Watts, right after the riot there, they had voted on a pension system for the Los Angeles police officers, and it collected 75% out of the Watts area. In Detroit, where there was over 600,000 Negroes, very few of these people participated in the riot. And I think that in the next week, there's going to be a committee of Negro leaders, business leaders, stand up and make a statement, make a combined statement, that no one speaks for them. Rat Brown don't speak for them. Reverend Cleek doesn't Officer speak for Purcell, them. Officer Purcell, would you uh, would you address yourself more specifically to the problem in Detroit rather than the problem elsewhere? Is yes, that... I think that the Reverend Cleek himself uh, states that the, he speaks for the people of Detroit. I have to say that in Detroit, that there were over 600,000 Negroes in Detroit, and certainly they did not participate in any riots. But I thought we was a minority, so how the hell is it 600,000 Negroes in Detroit? Reverend Cleeg has stated that the only thing that the riot proved was that the Negroes could uprise, and it did not prove anything because it was fought to a standstill. And I Yeah, that's what he was saying. Like he, he basically saying that, you know, that, that black people, the wealthy blacks with money, say that this Negroes don't, they ain't no one leader, which I can understand, but... This is what was going on back then and nobody understand. You had like people like Malcolm and them on the street. Then you had like the bourgeoisie niggas that we read in school, all these niggas. And then they was just, you know what I mean? They always had something to say. I think that he made a statement that if he had help from other Negro leaders like Carmichael and Rap Brown, that certainly it would not be a standstill and they would have won. Now I ask him, what did the Negro community want? The Negro community has come forward to the police department, Detroit, and asked for more police protection. They want protection. They have asked for more community programs. And I'm happy to say that in our letter to the police commissioner, we too have requested more police community relations. And I think that they are about to set up a storefront uh, system in Detroit where patrolmen will be involved in it, where they will be talking to the people in the community. But at the same time, when we are charged with defending ourselves, certainly we are here in defense of the police department. Uh, we are here in defense of all policemen. Reverend Clegg, uh, uh, we can, you, you I, are, we can, excuse me, Reverend Clegg. I'd like to answer the Reverend also. He is the one that advocated that the police department join rifle clubs so they could get superior weapons to kill black people during the next revolution. I, I would like to answer him for that. Reverend Clegg. Reverend Clay, uh, let me just to understand the basic issue, which is still being avoided in Detroit. You're avoiding my question, uh, Reverend Clay. Has advocated uh, <coughs> superior weapons, superior weapons for for black for the uh, white police department, the army of occupation. He has advocated nine million dollars, and I'd like to have a witness say something about the Stoner rifle, which is the most deadly weapon ever conceived that is now being purchased in huge quantities by the Detroit Police Department. And I'd like to ask Reverend Charles Butler, who is a pastor of the New Calvary Baptist Church and the chairman of the Defense uh, Committee of the Interfaith Emergency Council, to say a word on this Stoner rifle, which the Detroit Police Department is getting. I'd like together. to answer him on something he's talking about. Wait just a minute. Let, let's get the uh, the Reverend's colleague here. But Reverend, please uh, keep that little thing in your ear. I'm having difficulty asking you questions. But go ahead and let the gentleman comment about the weapon. Grab him by the talk, talk about that weapon that they get to get. One of the reasons the heat is raised in Detroit and will probably remain high is the stoner rifle requested for purchase by the Detroit Police Department. This rifle is a combat assault weapon. Caliber 223, extremely accurate, that can be fired as a semi or as a fully automatic weapon with a muzzle velocity of 3,300 feet per second and a range of a mile and a half. It has been demonstrated as capable of piercing incredible thickness of both soft steel and masonry. The bullet begins to tumble upon impact with target, boring, tearing, shocking, mutilating, maiming, and killing leaving gaping holes in its target. A soldier recently returned from Vietnam told me this week that in the zone where he was, the stoner rifle now in use there was considered so deadly that it was fired only on orders from an officer of captain's rank or higher. I am therefore deeply distressed that a civil agency wants a combat assault weapon 
and would like to know why. I am also distressed at the destructive power of the Stoner rifle or other high-velocity rifles and the likelihood that many innocent people can be killed or permanently maimed by its use, even people locked in their homes, since the rifle will shoot through masonry. Uh, Reverend, perhaps we can ask the uh, Detroit police... Uh, when he keeps saying masonry, he's saying shoot through stone. Officer who is in Philadelphia a little later, uh, the answer to your question of why they're doing this. But meanwhile, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to interrupt you for just a minute to ask uh, Dr. Reese, uh, in view of the fact that Detroit is a very familiar neighborhood to him, his headquarters are in Ann Arbor, uh, about this in terms of, of weapons. Uh, and then I want to go uh, for, a, for a reaction to Dr. Poussin about this whole issue of, of uh, lethal weapons and non-lethal weapons. Uh, do they, do they ab achieve any, any salubrious objective? I doubt whether an armed police in the sense of the stoner rifle is what Bloody we want up, in a democratic society. I doubt whether we want to calculate a... Hey, Bundy, send me your number in the inbox so I can get you on the show, bro, for this uh, miniseries. Policy of policing that is based on the use of weapons against the citizenry. And I certainly, for one, uh, would question seriously the basis on which such a policy is made. Dr. Poussin, have you uh, got some reactions of your own to this kind of, of technique? Uh, yes, I have uh, some reactions to that. I think it seems that police are more concerned with uh, uh, putting down riots and uh, enforcing law and don't seem to be concerned with some of the causes that are leading to some of the distress uh, and to the riots. Uh, so they react with sort of a, uh, repressive measures and we're going to uh, suppress more people and we're going to kill them and so on. Now I think this whole question of these new weapons that police uh, are getting uh, is getting quite out of hand and I think in particular uh, besides these rifles, the chemical uh, mace, which is a tear gas spray that's been purchased in large quantities by many uh, police departments around the country. Before we go into the techniques and, and technicalities of mace, I want to interrupt to ask Mr. Parcell in Philadelphia, the president of the Detroit Poli Police Office. And to give you clarity, this is 50 years ago, so a lot of the things, a lot of the tactics they're using on us today, uh, we can see why, like the tear gas and the type of weapons they use, and it was controversy back then. Officers Association, if he has anything uh, that he wants to say about this stoner rifle uh, in Detroit, uh, the question that was raised by the Negro clergyman. Uh, can you can you hear me, Mr. Purcell? Yes, I'd like to just comment on the last gentleman that said that the police are getting more interested in, in uh, riots and crime rather than uh, in the causes. I want to tell this gentleman that the police officers it's not his job for causes. We are supposed to be fighting crime and the riots or whatever the situation is. I think if we were allowed to do that and let other people handle the problem. But I have to go along with this rifle. They assume that we have hundreds of rifles. We are only asking for 150 for a specialized crew because we have no way of fighting snipers other than a specialized crew, special trained and under a command. And we need something. See, they was worried about them black soldiers coming back from that war. You know what I'm saying? They ain't gonna say it, but that's what they was worried about. They was worried about the black soldiers coming back from war with the military weapons and the snipers and, and all that. So when they say, that's what I feel like they talking. Like this. Mr. Parcell, let me, uh, I, I don't want you to, uh, I want you to keep right on it, but I want to interact, to interject up. something that I uh, was informed of, about the other day, and that is this, that in 23 riot cities, uh, that were studied meticulously uh, by the Kerner Commission on Urban Disorders and others. So far, there has not been one proved death due to civilian sniping. Now, that isn't to say that there wasn't sniping. I would like to answer you on that. Now, wait just a minute, uh, Mr. Harrington. I was I talking like to, to Mr. Parcell. Why did they bury the well, captain, the fire the, captain in when, the Just a minute, Mr. Harrington. I was asking him a specific question about uh, sniping. Well, when you say, when you say proof, I mean, this, this is a whole problem with sniping. This was a warlike condition that we got into. We certainly did not want to get into this. We were not prepared for it. Consequently, we are asking for these rifles. We do not, we want to prevent trouble. We're not asking, he said we're out here trying to kill black people. 
We're trying to save everybody's people. We're not out here to kill anybody. And we need some defense. I think that the the people have a demand for protection of property in their life. We're not out here to kill people. Now, I was asked, isn't 43 people enough? And uh, I said, it's too many. I know. Like, well, how about the uh, fellow that uh, is arming himself towards the police? No one seems to mention here that these black militant civil rights groups are arming themselves today with uh, automatic weapons. They have shot. See, this is a nigga where I come from, North New Jersey. So, you know, it's, it's sad, but this is to show you how much this was a big controversy at the time. Our guns, they are building stockpiles of Molotov cocktails. They have all other assorted homemade weapons that they have made, all to direct at the police. They have one idea. Kill Whitey, kill the white Mr. devil, kill the uh, police. Mr. Patrolman Kowaleski, let me ask you this. Uh, as you know, members of the National Rifle Association uh, are not only encouraged to have weapons of various kinds, uh, but it's made easy for them to get weapons under the auspices of the federal government. Uh, would you say that they should be treated in a different way than uh, than black citizens in terms of access to weapons? I don't see the connection between the National Rifle Association, of which I am a member and of which I say is a highly respected organization. If people got... For people, for, for everybody except for people of color. Weapons from the Rifle Association, they did it under false colors. They falsified records. They falsified government records. And I, if I am not mistaken, that this can be proven, these people can be prosecuted for falsifying these records, in which they should. What is their purpose and their object and their reason for getting these automatic weapons? Not because the police are getting them? They want them to use against us. Do you have I any would place like to do that? can tell you about like police armaments, people armaments. Mr. Morgan, I wonder whether I might ask Mr. Kowalski. Uh, of course. Chime right. Uh, this is Pro Professor Reese wants to ask you a question, uh, Patrolman Kowalski. Can you hear him? Yes, sir. I wonder why you think the people in Newark would want to arm against you. Why would they want to arm against me? Yes. I you. can give you a very good reason that this TV camera can pick this up. Here it is. Get the devil. Get the white devil. Get the man that represents the white power structure. Here's another article. The Wops want race war. Kill the white racist policeman. Uh, numerous other things here, if you want me to mention them, we'll say here. Now we've got to put the, get these four-legged and two-legged beasts. We know none of them, of the brothers and sisters, are going to stand for this dog business. Well, what's the motive behind what this sort of? Uh, what's the motive behind this sort of propaganda, Mr. Kowalski? I'll tell you what it is: to stir up the hostility between the police and the members of the minority group. You saw two perfect examples here tonight of why there is hostility toward the police. Just take one good long look at Reverend Clee when he says that we are the enemy, that we are the invader. And he, this is the man that says here that white policemen are the ones who are enforcing the laws for the white power structure. Let what is Reverend Klee going to do Mr. Kowalewski? What's Reverend Klee going to do? Mr. Kowalewski, let me ask you a question. Black power yeah, I'd, like to, Kerr, I'd, like, to know, I'd like to know from Mr. Kowalewski, number one, if he knows of any case in the black community where there are automatic weapons. Do I know of any case? Yes. Wasn't it recently that we just rounded up 15 people in the city of Newark for a, an arsenal of uh, automatic weapons? I don't believe so. You don't believe no, so? No, I, I don't believe like, so. Why don't you read the Newark Evening News? I do, I do. I read it very closely. In there, Mr. Mr. I read it very closely. Kerman, I would I, like, I'd like to ask also, you a question. I'd like Kerman, to also ask you. I gave you this file here that's filled with hundreds of people that have been locked up for carrying guns recently. I'd, I'd like to ask hundreds you another question, Mr. Kowalewski. Well, one thing we got to realize is the fraud in this whole situation is that the Constitution states that everybody has the right to bear arms. So even when I go to, even I tell a lot of my friends that got gun cases, I always tell them like, yo, it's the lingo. When you go to court, say, for the record, I do not know what a firearm is, but I, but I am, I, I was bearing arms. So it's the lingo. You can tell that it's clear that it's been a, it's been a, it's been about a 150 year process of, of de-arming the black community or trying to, because at this time you could tell that it was during the time right after the Watts riot, the Detroit riot had happened. And then you had the riot in Nook that happened. So this is what's going on to show you what leads, what, this is what leads to the police another day. Right. Do you believe that there has ever been a case 
of police brutality against a black citizen in the city of Newark? Now, it all depends on what you consider to be police brutality. Uh, physical I'm gonna answer your physical abuse of I'm a citizen in the city. Uh, physical abuse in the city. Now, listen, if I was to say that... Do you believe that there has ever been a case... Well, let me let me tell you one little story. Let me tell you one little story. Let me tell you one little story, Mr. Kowaleski. There was a woman by the name of Ida Brown. She was arrested by two police officers and charged with assaulting them. In Newark? In Newark. She was Negro. She was brought to trial. In a conversation during the trial, a prosecutor heard these police officers talk about how they had rigged this story against this woman. He removed himself from the case and took the witness stand himself and testified as to what he had heard. The case was dismissed. The interesting thing is that these two police officers have still to today not had charges brought against them for perjury or either departmental charges. I don't I know like about to ask you the departmental, uh, Mr. Kerman, I'll answer that. I don't know about the departmental charges, but I know that... As a result of that particular incident, were, were there police... perjury charges filed against well, these listen, police that's officers? Well, the county prosecutor. It's not up to the North Police. What do you mean it's up to the North Police? I said it's not up to the North Police. Why isn't it up to the North Police? It's you think the they court. should still be on the police the force court. if it's they could the... rig a story against a citizen it's and then bring them into the court? Attorney. This woman was convicted in municipal court, and she had to win this case on appeal. Yeah. If this prosecutor had not been willing, in fact, to admit that he heard these men say these things, she still would have been convicted in, in the higher court. Let me say this, Mr. Kerman. To admit that there are, to say that there aren't isolated cases of police brutality would be a bold-faced lie. Let me, now, let me tell you another story. There are isolated cases let, let me of tell you another brutality. story, Mr. Kavala. Make this one brief, you know, Mr. Kerman, because right. I want to get to Mr. Harrington, who I rather rudely during, interrupted. A during the ago. rebellion in the city of Newark, I was asked to meet with the governor of New Jersey, Governor Richard Hughes. After the meeting, he pulled me a... See, I could tell at one time when they kept the, when they when they made it to where the black woman was in the background, the black man had a lot to say, right? And so I feel like it was easier in the workforce to promote black women. I mean, they work harder too, but I think that, I think it was easier for them. Because if you look at from the 1900s to like the 1980s, right when they started changing the financial structure and the jobs in the 90s, my question is, I can tell from watching older videos that they were really didn't want to deal with the with the so-called black man because we had a lot of demands, a lot of questions, and we had a lot to say. ...side and said to me, you know, Bob, I heard that the police are out to get you. I want to give you my card in case you run into anybody that's going to do anything to you and tell them that you met with me and you know me. What about that, where a governor, in fact, can hear that police officers are out to get someone in the community? Could that be because your plants went to the governor and made this complaint like you have set up? I don't have any plants, Mr. Kowalewski. Uh, I don't Mr. have any Kirvin, plants. Don't give me that. Mr. I'll Harrington, give you what the facts are, buddy. Mr. Harrington, uh, I, I interrupted you a moment ago. I hope it wasn't completely off the train of thought. Do you have something that you want to come in with now? Yes, I had about 15 things if I had the <laughs> chance to come back and say them. But uh, now that I got the mic, why I'd like to say all of them. Uh, number one, in the city of Philadelphia here, a colored man came forward and squealed on RAM. On what, sir? RAM. It's a colored organization. RAM. A revolutionary action movement. movement. Now, this organization had hired him to shoot and kill the police commissioner, the mayor of Philadelphia, the district attorney of Philadelphia. And he pointed out to the police and to the FBI where the potassium cyanide was stashed away so that when they started the riot, they were going to poison 1,500 policemen. Now, I want to ask the, this reverend over in Detroit, who is the leader of the colored people in Detroit? Because I have a book here, uh, Reader's Digest, which is a very respected book, and it states that the, the New York Times said that the executive secretary of the NAACP in the city of Detroit condemns the police because they didn't put force into the riot area soon enough. Now, do they want force or don't they want force? I also hear about this high-powered rifle and so forth in this same book. See what he's talking about, if you want to be clear. Back at this time, 
you had you had the poor blacks and then you had the so called you had the mulattoes who was who was mixed, who was a little bit more wealthier, and then you had like the, the other ones who was a little wealthier, like the abolitionists, who at some point in generation was mixed too, if you do enough research. But you'll notice that they always say, well, you got one side of the black community that said we didn't help, and another side of the black community is the side with the money and the side without the money. It tells you how they do it in the other countries. In the other countries, they arm their police riot squads with machine guns. They have special uh, lead capes in England and all over the world. They've given their police the tools to do the job. Now, the people have to make their mind up. Now, let's do they ask, want riots? Let me finish. Now, I didn't interrupt you. <laughs> well, I'm sort of, I'm sort of in a in a tough spot here, well, Mr. Harrington. I know Harrington. you are, but you're always shortcutting us. Now, let us have our say, and we might as well go. I don't think we're shortcutting you, Mr. Harrington. And if you don't mind, we're going down to Chief uh, uh, Jenkins well, in Atlanta I'll tell you at this that particular because I don't point. Think you're giving us a fair shake. We'll get back to you, Chief Jenkins. Can you pull some of these strings together uh, from your right. point of view and and uh, uh, get some balance out of this discourse? Well, I'd like to say it. It's always the same fucking city. I want y'all to pay attention. It's always L it's always LA, Watts, whatever. It's always Atlanta. It's always North New Jersey. <coughs> it's always Detroit. It's the same cities. These are the cities that the police officers fear. That's why during the political year, as we watch with Ballad of the Bullet, Malcolm said the other day that during the political year, which is this year, it's going to be a lot of bullets flying because that's how they get the black people to vote for certain people for change. Good morning, bro. How you, Jalal? This point that I regret that most police chiefs do not appear on this program tonight because I don't think they've been well represented. Now, this program, I think, has emphasized that this nation has a very serious problem that we must find the answer to it. Now, the first order of business must always be law and order and justice for all. Now, the causes must be identified and they must be corrected. And that is exactly what we are determined to do here in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'd like for Reverend Williams to speak on that also. Uh, thank you very much, Chief. Uh, I, I've listened to the dialogue which has been going on here, and I... I know that the gentlemen in Newark have some problems, but I don't think we've been talking about what really concerns us. One of the things that I'd like us to get back on, and this is the question of white fear, and the fact that the police department in the city of Detroit... My first question is, why is every time that when you watch old shit, the only people they have representing the black community is Christians? We have to pay attention. Don't think religion. Think about the politics behind what's going on. If you look at, Malcolm used to always say, every time they want a black man to talk, he has to be a Christian pastor who they feel can control the, their people. Is arming itself with the stone of rifle seems to me to uh, lend support to the claim of the minorities in that city that they have something to fear. Uh, I certainly share the opinion of somebody who said this is not the sort of thing we want in a democratic society. Uh, now... One of the things that we've got to understand is that white citizens do not have the same reason to complain as Negroes do against the police department. Why is that so, Reverend? This is so because policemen do make a difference in the treatment of Negro citizens and whites. Why is that so? That is so because they, be they belong to a majority race of people who in this nation feel that there ought to be a difference made between Negroes and whites. Anybody in his uh, sane mind knows that in America we have made differences between white and Negroes for a long time, and the majority of the whites still feel Negroes are inferior to whites, and that they ought to be treated differently. Policemen are no different in this regard. I think the police department in Atlanta is working on the problem. We haven't cured it by any means. There are some policemen on our department here who haven't gotten the message yet that we are moving into a new area, a new era, and that they must themselves reorganize their attitude towards people. Uh, and when we talk about the hostility the police departments have, we've got to realize that I think most of these policemen feel they are representing the majority of the people in the community. I think in Atlanta, Georgia, when the police department knows that all of the citizens, including Negroes and whites, do not <laughs> condone any of the skullduggery which they may engage in, it will stop. It will happen in Detroit when white citizens support other citizens in that city. Seeing that policemen deal justly with all citizens, you will not have the same kind of problem. Now, well, anybody... Robert Williams, yeah. time, is, time is running out on us. We're going to get back to you, I hope. As you see, 
they cut it short. It's hard to find. I was looking for the real one for y'all, but that's called 50 Years Ago American Police Debate. The George Floyd situation. It was just crazy. Something that popped up. So that's one. How y'all feeling this morning? We can go to the next thing, which is the Kingdom of Kush. Give y'all a little history. <laughs> Sudan is one of the forgotten kingdoms of Africa and the ancient world. The kings of Kush reached the zenith of their power in the 8th century BC when they conquered their neighbor Egypt and their influence extended as far as the modern day Middle East. Sudan's capital, Khartoum, where the Blue and White Niles meet. The waters of the two rivers merge to form the mighty River Nile that flows through northern Sudan into Egypt and ends its journey there where it joins the Mediterranean Sea. The Blue Nile starts deep in the Ethiopian highlands and the waters of the White Nile flow from Lake Victoria in East Africa, although it probably originates from deeper inside Central Africa. The River Nile has for centuries played silent witness to the great civilizations that existed close to its banks. laugh quite rightly at my lack of goalkeeping skills. Personally, I don't think I'm that bad for a woman of a certain age. As I try to bridge the generation gap, so too does the town of Karima. It reaches down through the generations to a time long gone by when it was known as Kerma. And it is here that we begin the story of the Kingdom of Kush. Early humans existed in Sudan for tens of thousands of years. By about 5000 BC, we know that people in northern Sudan lived from fishing, hunting and basic farming. And there's evidence that they raised cattle too. They lived in relatively small, independent and separate population groups. They had to be mobile so they could find good pasture for their livestock. The rich waters of the River Nile made the land fertile, which meant crops could grow easily, so farmers could settle down and develop communities. The climate began to dry out gradually, starting from about 5000 BC across northern Africa, including what is today Sudan. This drove more people into the Nile Valley in search of hospitable land. It meant there were larger centers of population which became urbanized and a hierarchy of chiefs or princes developed. By around 2500 BC, Kerma had become the center for the people who came to be known as the Kushites. Their buildings include large structures called defufas, which stood up to 18 meters high. The ancient site of Kerma comprises two striking edifices, both built of sun-dried mud brick. They're known as the Western and Eastern Dufufa. Behind me is the Western Dufufa, which is believed to have been a temple. The Eastern Dufufa is a funerary chapel surrounded by a cemetery of mound graves.
Archaeologist and historian Dr. Abdul Rahman Ali is director of Sudan's National Museum in the capital, Khartoum. The two, the four first in Karma, these are two monumental map brick monuments. They belong to the Kingdom of Karma, which was known as the first uh, independent national kingdom in the Sudan, developed in 2500 BC. And the kings of Karma, they ruled Karma for almost a thousand years. And Karma was known as the first uh, and big urban center in the sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, these two monuments, uh, they were used as temples, used by the local community and the kings. And in these monuments, we could uh, find the first indication of the utilization of the brick in the Nile Valley, that is in uh, Karma. An important fact about Karma is that Karma during that time, it acts as a national symbol and united all the tribes of the Sudan in one uh, agglomeration. So we basically, do, in layman's terms, that it's the first identification in, in Sudan and or in Africa by the Nile Valley of anybody using mud bricks. We learn something about the inhabitants of Kerma from their death rituals, their customs, and what kind of objects they made and used. The traditional Kerma grave, like this one, is marked by a dome-shaped tumulus of earth outlined by a ring of black stones sprinkled over with white pebbles. The body was placed on the south side of the burial chamber. There was also pottery in the grave. Dr. Shadia Taha is a Sudanese archaeologist teaching at Cambridge University in England. Pottery is always abundant in all archaeological sites because it doesn't decay and it survived in all environments and climates. Pottery found in Sudan gave us information about the Neolithic groups who lived in Sudan at that time, um, Bronze Age groups and uh, Iron Age groups. Uh, we know a lot of deal about the clay they use, the techniques they use, the styles, the decoration. Uh, it tells us about the complexity of the ceramics. It tells us about trade and exchange. And um, what we know now, that pottery was found in Sudan at 8,000 BCE. The National Museum in Khartoum has many exhibits from ancient Sudan. Between 1780 to 1580 BC, Kerma culture was vibrant. The people wore beautiful jewelry. They had bronze mirrors, stoneware, and delicate pottery. Some experts believe the ancient Sudanese were the first to develop the technique of enameling pottery. This period of ancient Sudan's history is linked to that of its neighbor to the north, Egypt. At about the same time in ancient Egypt, that is around 3000 BC, the first dynasties were establishing the rule of the pharaohs. What was the relationship like between these two close kingdoms? It was both hostile and complementary. And over the centuries, the balance of power would shift from one to the other. As Shadia Taha explains in the writing of- If you play close attention, the question you should be asking yourself is who are the there's clearly these black black people let me show you this is why regardless of what you're watching you got to use your own eyes the question is these people at the top that's very 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 dark they're different from these people over here at the top which those would be the kushites to show you how much they had already been mixing Look at the shades of skin compared to the the people. Now you understand. You should understand what they mean by life started in South Africa. This is what the this is more of the original man, right? And then we get into Egypt where they had conquered Egypt many times, and you can see the amalgamation or the mixing. But if you go down and you look at all of this, look how this is changing. So I'm just giving y'all examples of why to use your eyes when y'all locked in and when y'all studying, even when you watching regular documentaries. Because even if they don't tell you everything, they're always showing you pictures that tell you everything. Of history, mostly by Western scholars, the importance of ancient Sudan in this relationship has been rather overlooked. 
host countries influence each other, but the Eurocentric group, they always thought of um, karma as um, younger than Egypt and always copying Egypt. But they didn't give um, karma the credit it deserves because karma was a very advanced state and its civilization predated Babylon, Rome, and Greece. So the exchange of ideas went both ways. It wasn't just a receiver of ideas from Egypt. So basically saying, so as you see, they said that they was learning from each other, but basically they was written out of history. So that should tell you that, that they didn't give them credit. So what was going on in Egypt? We value Egypt so much and don't even realize how much foul shit was going on in Egypt. Egypt, they were lighter. They was, you know what I'm saying? So they started feeling superior and started not even telling the truth about what was going on in South Africa. You know what I'm saying? Where... The, the people, because all the kin, when you learn, when you study Egypt enough, Egypt is the baby, not Kush. Egypt is the youngest of all of them. That's why the statues and everything is in the best condition. Everything else is older. So don't get it twisted. You know what I mean? In the documentaries, they'll make a mention, but they'll leave you, they'll leave you guessing instead of telling you the truth. Egypt is younger than Kush. Always remember that. When you're dealing with Egypt is the baby. All of the old civilizations got their shit together and taught Egypt and basically came together and helped build it. But when Egypt came down to write history, they gave themselves credit for everything. So there's another thing we got to also look at. When relations were bad, the pharaohs of Egypt would launch raids into Kerma. And the people of Kerma also raided the Egyptians. However, when their relationship was good, trade flourished between the two kingdoms. Donkeys were used as pack animals. Unlike camels, they need a lot of water. So that supports the theory that at this time, the climate in northern Sudan was more green and humid than it is today. As well as moving goods overland, they transported them along the Nile on boats that were later dismantled. The wood was reused in Egypt for building. But trade was hampered at certain times of the year when the Nile was impassable because of its cataracts. There are six cataracts in the river. The first of them is here at this very spot in Aswan in southern Egypt. The other five are in modern day Sudan. And as you can see behind me, cataracts are rock formations in the river. And this meant that boats and ships would crash into them unless the waters of the Nile were high enough for them to avoid doing so. That meant that for a large part of the year, the waters of the River Nile were not navigable. So traders would have to use overland routes and this was more arduous and took a longer time. Throughout history, the cataracts on the Nile gave the people of ancient Sudan a good natural defense from attackers coming by boat. Kerma laid the bedrock for the civilization of the Kushites. Kush was well known for its very powerful army. They were very fierce archers, and the Egyptians called them the land of the bow because of their skills in the bow. So they know their ability. And I want you to keep in mind how dark they really are. And their strength and their power. In 1650, the Kushites ransacked Egypt, but they just went back. Kush was a powerful state and the Egyptians feared Kush. So during this period of history, the Kushites succeeded in increasing their control of trans-African trade through the Sahara. And I want to say the more I study, the more I study Egypt and Kush and the wars that they had, the more looking at the hieroglyphs and, and it, it, the more it started making me feel like they were kind of like trying to defeat the darker empires. And if I'm tripping, y'all can check me on this, but if you really pay attention and use your eyes, Egypt was had a lot of fights, and they'd tell you, oh, we was fighting each other, but there was clearly a difference. ...to the detriment of Egypt. 
For thousands of years, camel trains have made this journey from the south across the Sahara to Egypt. These camels are resting by the roadside and taking water in Dongola, in territory that would have been part of the Kingdom of Kush. Kush was a vital crossroads for trade in the ancient world, linking the west and the east in the Red Sea and then from the south to the north in the Mediterranean. The overland route through the hot terrain was difficult in the past and still is today. This man tells me they've ridden from Darfur in western Sudan and on their way to Cairo. That's a distance of nearly 2,000 kilometers. <laughs> I wish him well on his journey to Egypt and bid him goodbye. Trade across land and along the Nile was of course a critical source of wealth and so the Egyptians wanted to regain control of this trade route to restore their fortunes. By 1550 BC, ancient Egypt was at the start of a new golden age and powerful rulers like Queen Hatshepsut and Tutmosis III made it their mission to build up Egypt's trade again. Tutmosis III sent an army up the Nile and defeated the people at Kerma. Now Egypt could take full advantage and exploit the kingdom's resources. So we was fighting each other. I always been saying this to you. We were fighting each other, <coughs> and for we was fighting each other for resources and to take over kingdoms because we wanted to dominate. Uh, in a lot of ways, we had weakened ourselves in so many centuries that we probably was easy taken on top of the dysfunction. A new kingdom arose further south from Kerma in Napata or Napta, as the Sudanese call it. My own opinion, they moved to Napta for economic, political, and religious reasons. Um, economic reasons because Napta was a meeting place for trade. The population was growing, as they were already urban. They needed more resources. More resources were available in those to supply an increasing population. And um, religious reason, Jabal Barkal is a sacred mountain which Egyptians and Kushites believe that Amun um, resides in Jabal Barkal. The uh, god Amun Ra. The god Amun Ra. So it is sacred for the Egyptians and the, and the Kushites. Kushite's new kingdom at Napata is near the modern-day town of Karima by a mountain known today as Jabal Barkal. Their move coincided with a... That shit's so old. I could tell it right here that it used to be something carved right here. You know what I mean? You could tell. It looked like a beak. It looked like some eyes. But that's how old this shit is. When you look kind of like the Grand Canyon. If you want to know what structures are the oldest, they look so old, but nature doesn't make anything that round. This is all, this is all something that's uh, that was made. You know what I mean? It was like a monument. Another decline in Egypt, which had become so engulfed in its own internal rivalries that it paid little attention to Kush. This meant the kingdom at Napata, which began in El Kuru, could develop undisturbed. And another thing is that all the ancient civilizations lived on top of like shit like this. So it was hard to invade them because they lived on top of a fort. As the civilization of Napta evolved from al -Kuru, it starts as a small chiefdom and developed to a kingship and later on developed to an empire. By the 8th century BC, the kings of Kush were growing ever richer and more powerful. At the Kushite capital of Napata, the mountain dominated the landscape, much as it does today. In its shadow, life goes on in Al Kuru. Time, I think, to abandon the open desert in search of human inhabitants. 
اهلا السلام عليكم شكرا ازيك يا اغرى ازيك كويسه تمام اهلا ازيك يا ايوه انت انت ابو روف I want to get a feel for the kind of settlements that existed in the ancient kingdom of Kush and how far some of the ancient customs and practices still exist in modern day Sudan. So I've been asking the ladies of the house to show me things which I know were used in the era of the Kushites and which I know were still used today. And this is what's known as a zee and this was used in ancient times to keep water cool. So I find it absolutely fascinating that I can find an old house like this that is just so evocative of that uh, period of Sudanese history. You can see the traditions of the Kushite kingdom still living on in the people who uh, inhabit this uh, area. People here eat the same grains and use similar earthenware storage urns. And the style of beds is one that has been in continuous use since ancient times. I remember beds like this from decades ago in the Sudan, but um, of course people have since moved on and tend to use mattresses, which is why I suppose why this has just been used as a repository for dates. So the wooden bed have an important uh, significance to the Sudanese community through the whole period from Karma, from 2500 BC up to now, because it have a significance in the uh, daily life for wedding the bride and groom. Their, their ceremony started on a wooden bed, we call it a grave, and even for the circumstances of the boys, it was used. And finally, it was used to carry the deceased. If somebody dies, he will be carried to his uh, final destination by a bed. I've come across a wedding party in a settlement at the foot of Jabal Barkal. The men are gathered waiting for the ceremony to start. I reckon I can seize the chance to go and visit the women at the wedding breakfast to see some female customs that have endured throughout the centuries. <laughs> The bridegroom very helpfully takes me across the road to meet the ladies. looking at this lady's hands with the henna and the beautiful gold, two things that we had, of course, in the Kushite kingdom, the gold and then, of course, the henna. The women of Kush dipped their hands in henna, decorated it, and they also wore coal on their eyes, like this lady here. <laughs> and this is the holder that the coal is kept in today. And uh, the bridegroom's aunt, Samira, is going to show us how they would use it. <laughs> Amazing, she did it without any mirror. <laughs> Kushite women, like one famous princess who lived in the 8th century called Amenirdis, wore elaborate jewelry. She probably had fine gold rings, bracelets, and colorful beaded necklaces, like these in the National Museum some made of ostrich eggshells. Amanirdis would have worn her hair flat to the head with a top knot, her long nails stained with henna, and her eyes darkened with coal. So you can see the continuity of tradition is very much alive amongst the women at the wedding preparations. And you can also see it in the very masculine pursuit of wrestling, an activity which has stood the test of time. The Kushites were renowned wrestlers and were held in high esteem for their skill and fighting ability. 
Today in Sudan, especially in the Nuba Mountains in the southwest of the country, wrestling tournaments are held regularly. In days gone by, the Kushites would have engaged in such wrestling matches for sport. These local young men are clearly letting off a bit of steam as well as entertaining spectators. By the early 8th century BC, ancient Egypt's fighting capability was much diminished. The country had grown weak and it could no longer ward off invaders. Egypt came under the rule of princes from Libya who had their own traditions and religion and had no regard whatsoever for those of the Egyptians. This was a source of great dismay for the Kushites. Through centuries of interaction, the Kushites had a religion and culture similar to the ancient Egyptians. They spoke their own Kushitic language, though they used Egyptian hieroglyphics for writing. By 750 BC, the Kushites had had enough of the decadence of the Libyan princes and their allies in Egypt. At that time, Kush was ruled by a king called Kashta, and he believed it was his duty to save the Egyptians from further ruin, so he decided to invade Egypt. We don't have any depiction of Kashta, but presumably he was not unlike the kings who succeeded him. Kashta's ambitions in Egypt were limited. He simply wanted to protect the religious center of Thebes, modern-day Luxor, in southern or upper Egypt. King Kashta was a force to be reckoned with. He owned the gold mines in Kush and controlled the River Nile and land routes for luxury goods like ebony and ivory from further south in Africa. At his base in Napata, between the third and fourth cataracts of the River Nile, around 450 kilometers north of the modern-day capital Khartoum, Kashta ruled over a flourishing community of Kushites. King Kashta's main place of worship was at the nearby temple of Jabal Barkal. From a distance, it's imposing, and as you get nearer, you can begin to make out the well-preserved remains of the temple. Kashta's army was renowned for the skill of its horsemanship and its archers, who would dip their arrowheads into poison to make them more deadly. Their speciality was to shoot their opponents in the eye. Kashta's army first... Yeah, that's crazy. He said they, they specialize in shooting opponents in the eye. And they specialize on warfare on horses. I ain't gonna make no comments on this, but... If you do enough research, you know what that is too. But you have to understand that they keep saying that they they keep saying that the Kushites wrote like the Egyptians, but the Egyptians wrote like the Kushites. For clarity, took Thebes, the religious capital of Egypt. For the most part, the Kushites were welcomed by the locals there, grateful that their co-religionists were seeing off the heathen Libyans. With Thebes secured. Kashta could rest easy. Three years after he'd begun the campaign into Egypt, King Kashta died. He was buried in Al Kuru in his homeland of Kush. Kashta's body was mummified in the Egyptian fashion and placed in a highly decorated wooden coffin covered in gold foil with inlays of colored glass and lapis lazuli. His body was placed facing east in the direction of which the sun rose and the coffin was placed in a grave like this, above which a huge pyramid would have stood. As befits a dead king, Kashta would need a large number of grave goods for the afterlife. Pottery, personal ornaments and jewelry were buried with him beneath his pyramid. The Kushite pyramids differ from those in Egypt. They're smaller, steeper, and made of red sandstone. There are 1,000 pyramids that have been discovered so far in Sudan, though only about 300 of them are still standing as pyramid structures. 
So do you think Egypt was first or do you think they were first? This common sense question. This part of the reason why I'm showing this to y'all. Everybody talk about Egypt. So Egypt got three, four pyramids. And they said that the Kushites had thousands of them. Common sense tell you that they were practicing. And then they, you know what I mean? So I want you to pay attention to, even though they're going to say this to you because this is how it's taught, common sense. In Egypt, there are about a hundred pyramids. Our pyramids, the Sudanese pyramids, have different aspects because their angle of building is very steep compared to that of Egypt. We know that the kings and queens of Kush were buried with all manner of um, personal belongings and furniture and also shaptis, which are these figures of people who would serve them in the afterlife. Were they actually ever buried with real, live human beings? This is the idea of accompanying the deceased. Because in one grave, uh, in 1916, in one of the kings of Karma graves, some of the deceased were covering their faces with their hands. So it means that these people were maybe put into the grave uh, intoxicated or uh, drugged and put to accompany the king. In the later period, there is no indication of intentional accompanying of the king. But they put the shaptis to serve the king in the afterlife. Let's go back for a second. It's some shit you'll never see. If they're flat, they're flat this shit right in front of your face. Hold and on. put to accompany the king. In the later period, there is no indication of intentional accompanying of the king. So basically, I'm gonna stop it right there. So basically, that they saying that the Kushites, they got dates on them too, that's crazy. Um, they saying that the Kushites, uh, that when the king was buried, they believed that they would like poison or drug people and, and then place them in there with their face covered, like covering their face. So that, you know what I mean? So that, they would have to accompany the king in the afterlife, and they don't they don't know any other kingdom, I guess, that they know of that. But I wanted y'all to see these pictures. Now look at listen to this. You know when you study Egypt, how um Ram is just holding these two things like this? So my point of the one thing I want you to think about is that the way that they're dressing their heads and all of this, understand that Egypt got its customs from somewhere. They didn't get them. They didn't make these customs up. The people came from the what we call down, what they call up north, up south. Where well, the people came from, what we would consider the bottom of Africa, the indigenous. But they put the shaptis to serve the king in the afterlife. These pyramids here by Jabal Borkal are an example of how pyramids were looted both in antiquity and in centuries later to come. The tips of these pyramids are believed to have been covered in gold foil, where clearly now the tips have been destroyed and the gold removed. Kashta's reign as King of Kush had lasted around 13 years. However, it was his son, Pianchi, who was to take further the mission his father had started. Pianchi was crowned king at the Temple of Amun in Jabal Barkal, probably in 747 BC, and he ruled for about 30 years until around 715 BC. Much of our knowledge of Pianchi comes from his stela, a massive slab of dark gray granite with 159 lines of text in Egyptian hieroglyphics known as the Victory Stela. It sets out how Pianchi first defeated and then ruled Egypt through establishing separate principalities. The Stela begins with Pianchi's words. Hear of what I did. I am a king, divine emanation, living image of a tomb, who came forth from the womb adorned as a ruler, of whom... I am a king, divine emanation, living image of a tomb. You know how we get in the Bible where they talk about Adam? Those greater than he were afraid, whose father knew and whose mother recognized that he would rule. 
Under Pianchi, Egypt came further under Kushite control. However, when he heard about a key victory by his army, he was not content because some of the Egyptian princes had escaped to the north of the country. Pianchi vowed to go into battle himself as recorded in his stela. I shall make the Northland taste the taste of my fingers. Pianchi pursued the Egyptian princes north and laid siege to them in their stronghold of Hermopolis. They eventually surrendered. After his victory, Pianchi searched through the palace for treasures. When he went into the stables and saw the horses had become emaciated during the siege, he was furious with the Egyptian prince. I swear that as Ra loves me, as my nostrils are rejuvenated with life, it is more grievous in my heart that the horses have suffered hunger than any other evil deed that thou hast done in the prosecution of thy desire. The Kushites were excellent horsemen and prized their best specimens. As his favorite horses died off, Pianchi would have them buried near the royal tomb that had been built for him. On his return to Naparta in Kush, Pianchi took with him architects and sculptors from Egypt, and he went about extending and reinforcing the great temple at Jabal Barkal. This is a computer-generated image of what the temple would have looked like. Pianchi ruled for nearly a decade after his campaign in Egypt. He died around 715 BC. And then no. During the conquest and during the wars, all of the years Egypt got invaded, um, they destroyed a lot of these monuments, and they destroyed they they destroyed a lot of the monuments. They destroyed they took they shot the noses off, the lips off. They took a lot of gold off the top of these buildings, and they wanted to leave. They tried their best to destroy everything, but certain shit was so huge and so gigantic that they just didn't have enough bullets to do this shit, and didn't have the technology to destroy them. So that's why a lot of the stuff still stands. But they did use, they, they've been practicing and trying to destroy this shit forever. Like other Kushite kings before him, King Pianchi was buried here at this site in Al Kuru, in a tomb surmounted by a pyramid built like this. In the centuries to come, his tomb was plundered, but we know that Pianchi was buried with many valuables. Fragments of furniture were found, a fine bronze stand, amulets bearing his name, and most importantly, four of his favorite horses were buried with him, entombed standing, their collars decorated with silver, plumes, and beads to serve their master forever in the afterlife. After Pianchi died, the throne passed to his younger brother, Shavaka, who succeeded in conquering all of Egypt. He moved his capital to Thebes. By now, the powerful Kushites had attracted the attention of the warlike Assyrians who were threatening King Hezekiah of Judah. He appealed to Shabaka for help, and he succeeded in warding them off. Kush was established as an African superpower. When Shabaka died in 702 BC, he was succeeded by his son, Shabitku, who again managed to see off the Assyrian. Go back for a second. You see, I'm going to show you how quick they'll tell you something and run past that shit. Go right here. Go a little bit further out. Tomb standing, their collars decorated with silver, plumes, and beads to serve their master forever in the afterlife. After Pianchi died, the throne passed to his younger brother, Shavaka, who succeeded in conquering all of Egypt. He moved his capital to Thebes. By now, the powerful Kushites had attracted the attention of... These are the Sumerians. Now, the reason why you know, the reason why I say you always pay attention, if you study ancient cultures, there's a completely different way they dress or how they do their beards or something that always identify these people so this would be the people what we would call it where they don't look like what we could say how should i say it? it's where iraq is today but that's what these people and they got as you see they got all these different names for the same places because they don't want you to be able to make sense just like the way time works on the on the on the on the, you ever see how time on the line the zeros in the middle and it goes out two different directions it's to confuse the person the warlike Assyrians who were threatening King Hezekiah of Judah. 
He appealed to Shabaka for help, and he succeeded in warding them off. Kush was established as an African superpower. When Shabaka died in 702 BC, he was succeeded by his son, Shabitku, who again managed to see off the Assyrians. When Shabitku died in 690 BC, the kingdom passed peacefully to his brother, Taharka. Well, inside the temples here at Jabal Barqal, you have these very rich decorations on the wall. And here on this wall, you have one of the greatest kings of Kush, Taharko, making an offering of necklaces, probably gold, to the god Amun-Ra, who is here. After Thebes was defeated by the kings of Kush, they assumed the style and the trappings of a pharaoh, and they became lord of the two lands. Now, to represent that, if you look at the top of Taharko's head, he's got what are known as the twin Uriah, and Uriah are the two serpent shapes that you can see representing Egypt and the land of Kush. So the serpent is you. If it is common sense. You can see it on the tomb. The pharaohs were the serpent, the kundalini energy, the DNA structure. And remember that the cobra is the only snake that can stand up on its tail straight up. It's the only snake that can stand straight up, just like a man, just like how the spinal cord works in the body. So that's why they had such a, a big thing about that. And the kings of Kush wore a tight fitting crown, which was actually a skull cap made of leather or metal with the sacred serpent symbols on them. And there's a cord necklace falling over the shoulders or down the back. And the kings of Kush are often depicted wearing a kilt. And the Kushites wore... That's another now, that's another jewel that they throw at you. That when they make the iris make it like they wore the kilts, nah. Or shoes or sandals, the poorer citizens went barefoot. But as a king, Taharko's sandals would have been made of leather, usually with a high curving strap extending along the entire foot and curving over the toes to meet the soles. And on special occasions, their sandals might be colored in red, yellow or green with decorations stamped on them in a snake pattern. Like the kings before him, Taharka was engaged in bloody rivalry with the Assyrians. This time, that's around 670 BC, King Azarhaddon ruled Assyria. In their first military encounter, Taharka defeated the Assyrians. But in a second battle in Egypt itself, the key city of Memphis fell to the Assyrians. Taharka was wounded and he withdrew from the battlefield and headed south to Thebes, where the Assyrians did not pursue him. Safe in southern Egypt, Taharka could embark on a huge building program. Why is the question. Why did they take Egypt? See, Egypt is right, where Egypt is located is right there. It's right there where you're crossing over from what we consider out of Africa into what we consider Africa today. So they were coming there, but they didn't want to go no further south because they knew the south was full of us and full of highly advanced warriors, fighters, and technology. Trust me. Even uh, when I was telling you, Genghis Khan conquered all of Asia on that whole continent. And then he stopped when he got to Africa. He didn't go, he didn't go nowhere. As soon as he got to the corner of Africa, he didn't go no lower. Um, and the evidence is still clear at the Temple of Karnak today. This column is the only one standing at its original height of the 10 pillars built by Taharko at Karnak. And this is yet further evidence of the impact of the Kushites building program in ancient Egypt. The sacred lake at Karnak Temple is a large rectangular basin and its waters come from the River Nile. Although it was already here when the Kushites took control of Thebes, it owes its current shape to Taharko. After an eventful life, Taharko died probably in Egypt. But he wasn't buried in the royal cemetery at Al Kuru, but here in nearby Nuri, he chose the highest spot in the area for his pyramid, which is the biggest of those still standing. Some archaeologists believe that it was originally enclosed in a much bigger monument. Taharka may not in the end have been able to prevent the Assyrian conquest of Memphis and the Nile Delta. 
The combined might of the Assyrians and their Egyptian allies proved too much for him. But his power and standing were recognized even many centuries after his death. In fact, he's mentioned twice in the Bible. Mm. Now, if you notice, when we talk about the Kushite kings, we're talking about dark-skinned people. When we talk about the Egyptians, we're talking about outside of the first like seven, eight dynasties up to like the 22nd. I think they had like 27. They were all, they got lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. And lighter. You know what I mean? So it's very important to understand who the Kushites are because we are more related to the Kushites than we are to the Egyptians. After Taharka's death, the crown pop Ham and Kush asked to his nephew, Tantamani. Tantamani became king at what could hardly be described as an auspicious time. Part of his kingdom was in the hands of the Assyrians and their Egyptian proxies. Tantamani decided to go to Memphis, not far from modern-day Cairo, to try to reclaim the city for the Kushites. Tantamani captured Memphis back from the Assyrians and restored his dynasty's glory, but his pride was short-lived. The Assyrians took the religious city of Thebes. They looted and utterly destroyed it. But deterred by the harsh climate, the Assyrians did not venture further south beyond Thebes and retreated. All right. So what did they just tell you? I'm going to show you why common sense is... is I'm going to go back. I'm going to break this whole thing down to y'all. ...for the Kushites. Tantamani captured Memphis back from the Assyrians and restored his dynasty's glory, but his pride was short-lived. The Assyrians took the religious city of Thebes. They looted and utterly destroyed it. But deterred by the harsh climate, the Assyrians did not venture further south beyond Thebes and retreated. So clearly they were not Africans. And they say, oh... Willie Walker, why you say that? Because if they, when he retreated from Egypt, see, Egypt must have at that time had more of a tropical climate or a, warm, a nice warm, a lot of water. But you notice that they, the Assyrians, they didn't go lower than Egypt. They didn't chase him back. He went to South, he went South Africa. And when he went there, he ran back there as if he knew they weren't going to follow him. And he didn't. And now they telling you the Assyrians... They, they didn't capture nothing lower than, a little lower than Egypt because the climate was too hot. They want Africans. The loss of Thebes severely undermined Tantamani's prestige. He returned to Kush humbled, but he remained king there until his death. His defeat by the Assyrians marked the end of Egypt's rule by the Kushite kings. They had formed the 25th dynasty of the pharaohs of Egypt a period that had lasted nearly a hundred years. The balance of power now shifted back to Egypt. The defeat of the Kushites in Egypt meant the sun had set on the golden era of the kings of Kush. They never returned to Egypt, but they did continue to govern in Kush here. Meaning that they ruled Egypt, but they weren't Egyptians. It's a difference. They ruled Egypt, and that Egypt had at this time, because remember, Egypt had got so far, because remind you, we're talking, this whole story is taking place probably in the middle of like 20,000 years after shit had already been jumping. Because when they they start off showing that they was worshiping Amun-Ra, well, that mean that Amun was worshiped in the south. I mean, Ra was worshiped in the south, and Amun was worshiping in the north of Africa, and, and they had already had already had all these wars and became Amun-Ra. You know what I'm saying? So this is, it's already starting the story. That's the problem with history when they, then it's hard to get you, start you from Dynasty 1 because they're not, they're not giving you that much detail. So they will give you detail, but you got to figure out which dynasty. Then you got to put them in order to try to understand the fashion because they each one of these, as you watch, they give you all these names. The question is, are you going to go look into these people? In Northern Sudan for another thousand years. The Kushites built a new base called Meroe, about 250 kilometers north of Khartoum. An area known today as al Bajrawiya, and not to be confused with the modern city of Meroe. This is 
the royal cemetery of Neri. But it wasn't until the 3rd century BC that the kings and queens of Kush were buried here. The Kushites quickly developed a new and prosperous kingdom here. People began to farm as well as rearing livestock, and Meroe became a central point for commerce. An abundance of iron ore led to the working of iron. Because metal at that time was very precious, they traded it. Their trade included um, Egypt, through Egypt to the Mediterranean. It went to India and China and to the rest of Africa. And that is why they became wealthy. Caravans and the trade in iron, beads and um, glass and linen. Because they had the iron ore, they had um, the river Nile, they had water and they had organizations. Iron work in Marawi is equivalent to industrial revolution in, um, in the West. The royal family lived here at the royal city. Suzanne, they, their iron work their iron work was just as big as the Industrial Revolution is told in America. So when they say in the West, they're talking about what happened in America. The buildings included a palace, a library, and baths. The royal city is the best preserved part of the ancient city of Meroe. All around you, you can see the remnants of buildings, monuments, and structures of a civilization that at its height enjoyed all the attributes of urban life. would have been one of the finest tombs and pyramids at the Royal Cemetery in Meroe. It was for Queen Amani Shahito, who ruled Meroe at the end of the first century BC. It was full of fine jewels and other belongings to serve her in the afterlife. But her tomb was plundered by the Italian archeologist Fellini in the 19th century. And after her bath, Queen Amani Shahito and other members of the royal family would just walk a few steps, come here, sit on one of these chairs, and enjoy a good massage. Where's my masseur? The queens of Kush at Meroe had a powerful role. Unlike the ancient Egyptians, women could succeed as monarchs in their own right or they could rule jointly with their husbands or sons. And the king's relationship with his mother was of extreme significance. What do we... That's the point I'm making this whole, this whole point of this video, is that the Egyptians were foreign. Most of the, the concepts of the Egyptian rulers were foreign rulers with foreign concepts. But when you're dealing with the Kushites, when you start going down, they're darker, and then their women could rule side by side with them at the throne, and they were equal. That's ancient culture shit. There's nothing new about it, but people praise Egypt and don't understand how sick Egypt was. You know what I mean? I always said one thing, the reason why I knew Egypt had to be mostly foreigners, as far as like who, who took over it for most of the periods was because the Egyptian, if the, if the indigenous culture knew that the hair was its connection, its antennas, then why did the Egyptians cut them off? It's like all of the practices by the Egyptians that if you look at the from like the Ape Dynasty and up, they practice things that were kind of against nature. Even if you look at the things they were doing. But if you look at the, the, the kingdoms that were just as powerful that they were fighting with, like Kush, who were darker, their principle was different. So as you heard, let's go back. Because they make it clear to you that Egypt did not respect women. As much. That's why Hatshep Sut was the only female, one of the only female pharaohs in the 19th century. But she ruled as a man, meaning her, the public thought she was a man. And after her bath, Queen Amani Shahito and other members of the royal family would just walk a few steps, come here, sit on one of these chairs and enjoy a good massage. Where's my masseur? The queens of Kush at Meroe had a powerful role. Unlike the ancient Egyptians, women could succeed as monarchs in their Look, own right, Peter. or they could rule jointly with their husbands or sons. And the king's relationship with his mother was of extreme significance. 
What do we know about Queen Amani Shahidu? Queen Amani Shahidu, we know about her jewelry. She was covered in jewelry and she used to love, well, all Kosai's women loved gold and jewelry. She was a large lady. Uh, I have this mug, which depicted her in most of the temples and the cemetery as um, a very large woman. This is for two reasons. Large ladies, it is a symbol of prosperity. Yo, look at this fucking mug. Now, I want you to use your eyes. Now, please, y'all come on, comment. What is this? What is she doing? And look at look at them hips. This is what the cushions look like in the... Now, look at... Look at Tell me, tell me what is going on in this picture. Stop playing. Even in these documentaries on TV, they'll show you some shit and, and won't say nothing. What is she holding? And, right, arrow her hand to what? Come on, y'all. I know y'all got opinions. Keep it a band, though. What is going on in this picture? They are enslaving the pale race. and a symbol of affluence. That means she was well-fed and she wasn't starved. The other thing I, I believe that, uh, because if you could see here in this mug, she is uh, fighting an enemy who was shown as smaller than her and she was really um, towering over him. So that could be another reason, maybe exaggerating it, the size in, um, in these um, carvings a little bit, but uh, they were still plump. <laughs> she's still so plump. She still, yeah. she still had it. Amani Renas mm. actually fought the Romans. Pretty powerful warrior queens, weren't they? Yes. Um, they led armies. And um, they used to go and really do lots of raids in southern Egypt. So the fights between the Romans and the Mer of Chokoshites continued. Uh, Queen Amani Renas in one of the battles, she was blinded in one eye, so she became the queen with one eye. And in the year 22 BCE, the Romans make a treaty which benefits uh, the Merovites just to stop the fight between the two of them. Yeah, it's funny because I keep hearing them say the Merites, right? The Merites, the Mer the Merites. But common sense will tell you it's the Mobites because they specialize on fighting the horses. Think about it. The Merovites, the Mobites. The Moors fought on horses. Now I'm talking about just to think about it. They specialize in horses. They got mad at the Egyptians because of how they were starving their horses when they took over, how the horses was not well fed. But we know that the Moors specialized in welfare on horses, so the way that they appreciated it, right? The women in these situations is different too. So it's just showing you, like, it's that easy to miseducate or mistranslate, or maybe as we would call them, the more right might be the more properly term. But either way, I just wanted to draw that comparison. At Meroe, the Kushites embarked on a big building program. You can see here at the ancient site of Musawarat, clear evidence of temples and uh, we think also palaces and other monuments. The Kushites interacted with other civilizations, ancient Romans, the Greeks also. Right, what up? And you can actually see this quite clearly in the influence, for instance, of ancient Greek architecture in this column here behind me. Until the second century BC, the Kushites had written in ancient Egyptian, and then they introduced their own form of hieroglyphics which is also pictographic, like the ancient Egyptian one. And it's one of the great mysteries of the Kushites. We just simply cannot read their Meroetic language. We have an idea of what it might have sounded like, but we can't understand it. Why did the Kushites introduce their own hieroglyphics? Well, we believe it's because the population formed in smaller groups and began to move around, and so they needed to communicate with one another. The Meroetic era of ancient Sudan boasts many fine buildings which showed the Kushites lived in some style in this period. In the mid first century AD, King Natakamani and his wife. So I want to say this remember that when you're dealing with, if you if you dealing with uh, the history, that everything came up the now. You know what I mean? Everything came down the now because it was, 
It was up south, down north. The north floor is the higher. When you go to the south of Africa, you're going up mountains. And when you go to the north of Africa, you're going down. All Everything, the food, the source of life, the history, the information, the technology, everything about it traveled downward into North Africa. So the, the concept of that Egypt, which is at the is at the bottom, gave life to upper to, to, to the bottom going going to South Africa, going downward is a fucked up concept because the water don't even flow that way. You know what I mean? You're going to you're going completely against current current and, and against everything that's going on. But you can clearly tell when you look at the Kushite empires, they are completely what we would call African. When we look at the Egyptian empire, we look at you, the phenotype keeps changing over and over. Each dynasty, you be like, well, damn, they look kind of Chinese. Alexander the Great and them, the, the Greeks, which were dark-skinned people, had, in, had infiltrated because the other female ruler was Heffin Typhus. So that's that impact. So it was so many, whoever ruled, when, when the Assyrians took over, they ruled for a couple dynasties in Egypt. So when you see Egypt, it's not one people. Egypt is like this, this one place that constantly got taken over from the so-called African with after like the eighth and ninth dynasty by the Hittites. In Amanitere were prolific builders at the site of Naka. There were statues to Apedimak, the lion god. The Kushites worshipped the same gods as the ancient Egyptians. However, Apedimak was unique to them. But the success and riches of Meroe attracted envy from a powerful new king. And everywhere you go, you kind of see these big old walkways like doorways because that square, rather if y'all want to believe it or not, that square is ancient as shit. It's the reason why it's used in the masonry, the square, the doorway. Every time you walk into your doorway, every time you walk in a building and you walk in between that, that look like an H, that shit holy. And you never even thank your ancestors when you walking in the buildings and when you going to work or wherever you go. Every doorway you, every doorway you walk in is an ancient symbol of of, of the ancient times of our ancestors understanding um, technology. Because it's like them doorways, the front and the back doors. That's what most of the weight of the house is. You know what I mean? But you, it's something that's not understood today. Kingdom called Axum in what we refer to today as the Horn of Africa. The Axumites like American put Kush under pressure, contributing to its decline in the 4th century AD. Look, what up, the bro? fall of Kush meant a glorious chapter in the history of ancient Sudan and Africa came to an end. In the next program, we find out about the Kingdom of Aksum, what led to its rise, and why it was described as one of the four great civilizations of the ancient world. So, I'm just giving y'all some insight. We gonna dig, y'all, I'm, I'm gonna dig with y'all, because I'm gonna show y'all slowly about all these different sections of Egypt so that you can get a better understanding of what's really going on because the school wasn't going to do it and they're not going to show it. And a lot of places, nobody had the time to go find it, so I will try to bring it to you in pieces. But right now, I want y'all to keep a side note, that was the Kushites. And I and, and the Kushites, those were complete, thick hair, big lips, big nose, big ear rulers. Women and men rule side by side in this kingdom. That's the original order of things. And the women won't docile and the niggas won't docile. So I want y'all to understand, or the men, let me say it properly. The, the black women, they were warriors and strong. And the men, they were strong. And this was a way of life. So it didn't have to be so much of a weakling in order for this balance to work. There was a certain level of respect and pride that they were raised with. So that I could, you know, pretty sure they didn't have as much problems as we do today. But the name of that was the Kingdom of Kush. Israel, Africa. And Dr. Ben, I can show you, I'm gonna show you at times later about some Dr. Ben talking about the same areas so you can cross-reference it. Now, I got a good one for you. This is called the, His the New York's History of Slavery. Because everybody wanna talk about up top was so free. commercials <laughs> but yeah this is uh this called it's called new york and the history of slavery we 
still the preeminent global financial center. As far as money and media go, it's the city that's the world headquarters for both. And so perhaps the title center of the world is fitting. But here's an unpleasant reality less talked about. While New York, both the city and the state were centers of the abolitionist struggle to finally end slavery, it was actually enslaved Africans that built the infrastructure of the colonial city. And it was that way from the 1600s to 1827, when slavery was legally abolished in New York City. Oh, message. So slavery in New York was ended in 1827. So I want y'all to understand what the fuck was going on at the time. And I know I noticed this a couple years ago. Each state chose to win. It said when New York chose to free its slaves in 1827. North Carolina and Texas, they was real fly with their shit. They chose not to free their slaves in like 1865. So they kept their slaves broke. We rarely think of New York as a slave-holding city, but it had more slaves than any other city except Charleston, South Carolina. It's inconvenient, uncomfortable, and for some, shameful. Perhaps that's why many shy away from talking about it but not Alan Singer, who's lived in New York all his life. Dr. Singer is a professor of secondary education at Hofstra University and a former New York City High School social studies teacher. He's the author of New York and Slavery, Time to Teach the Truth. I met with Dr. Singer in Lower Manhattan. He agreed to take us to some of the most important sites related to slavery here. The African Burial Cemetery was used between the late 1600s and 1796 and originally contained between 10 and 20,000 burials. Despite the harsh treatment that these African people experienced in colonial America, the 427 bodies that eventually were recovered were actually buried with great care and love. They were wrapped in linen shrouds and placed in coffins that sometimes contained beads or other treasured objects. And what happens is the burial ground is listed on old New York City maps. But in the 1790s, as the city grew, the burial ground itself was just paved over. And then in the 1990s, the federal government decided to build this new office building here. And when they excavated this site for the foundation, they found hundreds and maybe thousands of uh, bodies that had been buried prior to 1790. All of a sudden, there was a tremendous investigation because it, what they discovered from the maps, this is the African burial ground. What happens is as New York City grew, people are familiar that Wall Street had a wall. But Wall Street wall was in 1664 when it was a Dutch city, New Amsterdam. When at the time of the American Revolution, it's a British city, and the wall is actually on Chamber Street, just on the other side of this building. Africans, even though they were Christian, were considered to be heathen, and they were not allowed to be buried on the church grounds within the city limits. So they are buried outside the wall in this area just outside New York City. Now, part of the reason that this area was used, it's also very swampy. Uh, just below, we'll see, is what, uh, an area they called the Collect and behind. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great Melrose. That's exactly what it is. And that is an area called Five Points. It's very swampy areas. As a result, they were not prime for people to live. This was used as the African burial ground. The whole area was just paved over. It was lost to history. It was erased from the past. And it was only found when they started digging the foundation for this office building. The African American community demanded answers after the cemetery was rediscovered in the 1900s. What eventually happens is uh, uh, forensic scientists and uh, anthropologists, archaeologists from Howard University investigate, they establish who these people were, they study the bones, they recognize the hardness of their life, and then the, the people, about 500 people who are dug up, are then reinterred in a ceremony in these mounds. So these mounds contain about five, the remains of 500 people who originally were buried after that. And then he's going to use the word mounds, so that means that whatever he studied this shit at, 
it used the word mound. If you know anything about the indigenous American so-called so-called black man, a.k.a. Moore, is that the mound builders came from America. These huge mounds, earth mounds, right? Huge, right? And now they're going to build these bodies and mounds. This is holy. That's why I sick again. This ain't just some regular shit, no slave. This is, this is sacred shit. The whole area. Singer says that the time of the American Revolution, around the 1780s, the population of New York was about 10,000. 15% of that population were enslaved Africans. In the United States, people usually think that slavery is an institution of the South. But slavery is actually a national institution. Now, in a place like New York, we're not looking at plain... No, slavery was a global institution. Patience. And we're not looking at primarily agricultural work. We're looking at people building the infrastructure of the city. We're looking at people clearing forests. We're looking at people building roads, building fortifications. So why, why, why does black people, why moving, clearing land, building roads, building buildings to us in America sound like slaves? But in Europe, when the Moors went into Europe, and went into all in India and China and helped them build the buildings in a great wall, they were considered Moors. But every time you talk about somebody building roads and structures in America, oh, they had to be slaves. So you know that the Moors and then was the Moors and the Europeans from the time when they got here in 1492 was they were building buildings. This predates all of this shit. Bridging harbors. And the people who did this work or enslaved Africans. As we walked across the city to Foley Square, Alan tells me about how it was here that enslaved Africans... i just show you how the truth be in plain sight. Three blacks and white supporters accused of plotting the 1741 slave conspiracy were executed. White New Yorkers, afraid of a slave revolt, responded to rumors and unexplained fires with the arrest of 146 enslaved Africans the execution of 35 blacks and four whites, and the transport to other colonies of 70 enslaved people. Historians continue to doubt whether a slave conspiracy ever existed. Hey, yo, it's this show on Netflix right now. I need to start watching it today because I'm... It's about a black girl who during this same time, it fucked me up because it showed a black girl on a stick. Let me go back. This is just mine. This is why I'm going to go back because they'll show you some shit. Hold on, let me go back, go back, go back. There's a show, right? There's a show that just came on Netflix about this black girl, she a witch. And there and, and when and, and on the previews, these white people are burning her at the stake and then she disappears and, and pops up out of water. It's called she a witch. And she pops up in today's time. But she do some type of magic to keep herself looking young or whatever. Now, during this whole section of time, what they're showing you is that is different colonies. Now, some of these pictures, if I, I'm going to stop and show y'all because in these pictures, y'all going to see people with turbans on. So we're going to see how many times they stoke, they, they going to freeze up on this. Historians continue to doubt whether a slave conspiracy ever existed. It's 1741. It's a bitter cold winter. It is so cold that the Hudson River freezes. What happens is it took a wood town. People are just burning whatever they can to keep warm, and there are fires that break out. In April, the white population of the city suspects that the black population, the enslaved population, is planning a rebellion. And then all of a sudden, 1741, over 150 enslaved Africans are arrested and accused of plotting this rebellion. What's interesting is the whites did not believe that the Africans could plan it, so they actually arrest a white tavern owner and accuse him of planning the uprising. So they put on trial. As I hear him tell the story, it sounds like there was 150 like royal Moors or whatever you want to call them, and they it sounded like an excuse to round up some people. Because this is what was going on. The rest of the Africans was enslaved. We know that in 1776, the, in 17, which is 30-something years later, the Moors and the Europeans signed a treaty. So why all of a sudden, every, that's what I'm saying. You have to investigate what were slaves and where were the Moors and where were they turned into slaves and what documents was changed.
Because clearly they said New York was the center of the world, but we just seen them letter about Joe Washington showed you that they were doing what? They were paying homage. But this was, in New York is a settler's area. That's where they let the settlers live. And what happens at the trials? The Africans are basically given a deal. If you confess, we will send you to Barbados to live out the rest of your life on the sugar plantations. But if you don't confess, we're going to burn you alive at the stake. Some people confess. Uh, the four whites are hung. Uh, what happens is that the two of the Africans, who accused of being the ringleaders, they refuse to confess. And they finally, they drag them here to, uh, to burn them alive. And they threaten to burn their families alive. And the two men, ultimately, they say, okay, okay, we'll confess. And there's a mob of whites here, and they scream and they want them executed. These men are burned alive. Here. Right here at Foley Square. The thing is, with flesh burning on open flames, the stink would permeate the entire city of New York. Now, one of the things is there's actually a woodcut drawing of the scene which shows families coming to watch the scene, very reminiscent of some of the scenes from the French Revolution, the guillotine. Uh, there's a commentator from New England who looks at the trial transcript and said, this is like the Salem witch trials. This is an hysterical population, fearful because of fire. All of a sudden attacks a helpless group of people, enslaved Africans, it executes 35 enslaved Africans, and the four whites they believe are the ringleaders. If they were slaves, then why the fuck would they even want have a trial? That's one. So that's one lie. Two, why the fuck would they give them an option to send them to an island which was known as a maroon colony because they had then freed themselves, right? So uh, slaves didn't get trials. Last time I checked, slaves got whipped and they ass whooped. So I hear a, a whole bunch of, not saying him, but if you know anything about history, this is whatever he read, he just didn't understand. Happens right here in the city of New York. Navigating our way through the busy streets of downtown, we arrive at New York's famous city hall. They had to give him a trial. Think about what I'm saying. They arrested these 150 black people, so-called slaves, and then they had to give him a trial. They needed, they needed them to confess that they were guilty to do something to him. Slaves didn't have that right. Although slavery ends in New York State legally, in 1827, city merchants and bankers continued to be tied to slave trade and slave-produced commodities. For example, William Havemeyer, mayor of New York City, launched his political career from the family's sugar refining business. The sugar was produced in the South and Cuba by enslaved African labor. Havemeyer owns a sugar company which offices are just across the East uh, River in Brooklyn. At, at the time, it's known as Havemeyer Sugar. Now it's known as Domino Sugar. Domino Sugar, owned by the mayor of the city of New York, is producing sugar in the Caribbean. And it's being processed in Brooklyn and distributed around the world. Another New York mayor, Fernando Wood, who later becomes a congressman, opposed and campaigned heavily against the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which abolished slavery. In uh, 1861, as the nation is moving to civil war, the South is starting to secede. The mayor of the city of New York actually gives a speech to the New York City Council, and he proposes that New York City secede along with the South. And he makes this proposal because he says they owe us so much money, we are so commercially tied together, if they leave and we stay, how are they going to pay us back? But it wasn't just the sugar trade, it was also cotton. Singer writes in his book, the founders of Brown Brothers Harriman built their bank by lending millions of dollars to southern planters and arranging for the shipment and sale of slave-grown cotton. When the bank took control of three Louisiana plantations at one point, it also got 346 enslaved Africans. John Jacob Astor, America's first multimillionaire, made his fortune in part through cotton transportation. He was also part of the slave trade. The Waldorf Astoria Hotel and neighborhoods in New York City are named after him. Lehman Brothers, a merchant- Whoa, whoa, let's go back. It's a, it's a picture of a fucking slave on the building. 
Corporation. Oh, he was also part of the slave trade. The Waldorf Astoria Hotel and neighborhoods in New York. What type of shit is this, man? Shit right there. City are named after him. Lehman Brothers, a merchandising business that quickly evolved into a cotton brokerage firm, is another example. And finally, Charles L. Tiffany, who got the financing to open a fancy goods store from his father, who operated a cotton mill in Connecticut using cotton picked by Southern slave labor. Tiffany & Co., the internationally renowned jeweler, was born. The list goes on. Today, the South Street Seaport is one of New York's many waterfront tourist attractions with restaurants and gift shops. Singer explains that although in 1807 it was illegal to bring slave Africans into the United States, a restaurant named Sweets continued to be the meeting place of the global slave trade in secret. And just up the street was the bank that financed the slave trade, Citibank. So the slave trade was abolished in 1807. Look at all these different fucking dates. You got the slaves in, in the last slaves, or the most in 1865. You got the ones in New York free, basically in 1827. You got the banning of damn slaves being traded in 1807. What the fuck was going on? It's a capital offense after 1820 for an American to be involved in slavery. We still do hell of business with them. And we have documentation of what's happening. It was in 1854, one of the slave traders is arrested. He's turned in by his crew. He cheats him on pay. He's furious that he's being put on trial for slave trading. So he testifies, and his testimony is on the front page of the New York Times. And then later, he writes it up into a book. And he, what he says is that at Sweets, at South Street Seaport, at this restaurant, the slave traders meet to plan their voyages. And a couple of blocks up this way, south of us on South Street, is the bank that finances the slave trade. And what they're doing is they call the Africans Black Ivory, and what they do is they outfit the boats here, they, they then sail to Africa. In Africa, they load enslaved Africans and they bring them back to Cuba. Amistad is not an isolated case, but Amistad is part of this transatlantic shipment of human beings. Dr. Singer was the director of the New York and Slavery Complicity and Resistance Curriculum. April Francis, Allen's former student at Hofstra University, joined us later on the tour, along with her son Jalen, a senior in high school. April was a history major and is a graduate of the teacher certification program. She also holds a master's degree and certificate of advanced study. April helped edit and field test the New York and Slavery Complicity and Resistance curriculum. She teaches social studies at Lawrence Road Middle School in Uniondale, New York, where she is a cooperating teacher for students in the Hofstra Teacher Education Program. In 2005, the New York and Slavery Complicity and Resistance curriculum was awarded a National Council for the Social Studies Program of Excellence Award. Um, it was actually very shocking, you know, um, teaching history Normally we talk about the North and South, and South being predominantly the area that slavery was um, the institution. This is a short video. Hold on one second. This shit had me really thinking. Let's, let's, let's find out something. See if they got, let's see if they got anything on the Amistad court case. Because they came with their movie Amistad. Let's see. Let's get it. 
I found it. Sound like it's ain't playing another one side. In the summer of 1839, a foreign schooner accidentally sailed along the shores of the United States and transformed the federal courts into a forum for an explosive national debate. The drama that began when the enslaved Africans on the Amistad revolted and took control of the vessel off the coast of Cuba would culminate in the Supreme Court of the United States, with a former president arguing on behalf of the Africans' appeal for freedom. The Amistad case forced the federal courts and the nation to consider the legal foundations of slavery. For several weeks in the summer of 1839, newspapers along the Atlantic coast reported sightings of a mysterious schooner supposedly commanded by African pirates. Late in August, the crew of the Navy brig Washington spotted a badly damaged vessel in Long Island Sound and a shore party trading with local residents along the New York coast. When the naval officers boarded the Amistad, they were embraced by two Spanish men pleading for protection from a group of African men whom they had purchased as slaves in Cuba, but who had taken control of the ship. The crew of the Washington took custody of the Amistad and the 42 Africans on board. They towed the schooner to New London in Connecticut, a state where slavery was legal, rather than to a port in New York, where slavery had been abolished. Under the law of salvage, anyone who rescued a ship from danger was entitled to a portion of the value of the ship and its cargo. Once in port, the commanding officer of the Washington contacted the federal marshal and requested a hearing in the U.S. District Court for Connecticut in order to file a claim of salvage. He and the crew intended to submit a claim for rescuing the Amistad and its cargo, including the enslaved Africans. On August 29th, the Amistad case entered the federal judicial system when U.S. District Court Judge Andrew Judson convened a court of inquiry on board the Navy ship Washington in New London Harbor. Judson, along with the U.S. Marshal, the Clerk of Court, and a group of observers heard testimony from the two Spanish planters about the Amistad's voyage from Cuba to New England. The planters, Jose Ruiz and Pedro Montes, testified that each had purchased a group of slaves in Havana, then chartered space on the Amistad to carry the slaves to plantations along the coast of Cuba. Several nights out of Havana, the enslaved men freed themselves, and in their struggle to take command of the ship, killed the captain and his cook. The leaders of the revolt forced Ruiz and Montes to sail the ship in the direction of the rising sun and West Africa. But each night, the Spaniards shifted course to the north and west in hopes of encountering another ship. Nearly two months later, the Amistad... So clearly these men knew... Clearly, I guess they, they knew something about sunrise, sunset, and navigation. But they were out smarting them, out witting them, you know what I'm saying? Probably at night when they were sleeping. It ...reached Long Island Sound, desperately short of food and water. One of the enslaved Africans on board the Washington during the inquest was a young man, Singbe Pie, who would become better known as Sinke. You hear what they said this nigga name was? This nigga was a moor. Look at how he dressing. He got the raise name was Simbe. Oh man. One of the enslaved Africans on board the Washington during the inquest was a young man, Singbe Pie. Who would become Sing Bay Pinye. 
This shit crazy. Better known as Cinque. He spoke neither English nor Spanish and could not testify at this court session. But Cinque was recognized by the court officers as the leader of the Africans on the Amistad. Reporters at the hearing commented on his composure, characteristic of true courage. Sinke's presence dramatized the unique character of this case, a case that resulted from the act. Sing Bay, why is shit crazy? Because they keep calling they say Sing Bay, better known as Sinke. Actions of enslaved Africans, and in which these African captives would appear in courtrooms to assert their right to freedom. Judson moved the court to the Amistad itself in order to hear testimony from Antonio. A he ain't even dressed like the rest of them. Slave who served as cabin boy to the slain captain. Antonio recounted what he had witnessed the night of the revolt. Look at this old scared ass nigga. He he was um <laughs> he was he was the captain's um basically the captain's slave when the black people fighting his ass up there hiding and shit. <laughs> and in the Amistad's hold, crowded with the Africans in custody. He identified those who had led the revolt along with Sinke. After hearing the testimony, Judge Judson ordered the U.S. Marshal to hold the adult Africans in custody in a New Haven jail. He also ordered that Antonio and three young girls purchased as slaves in Cuba be held in custody to serve as witnesses. The testimony revealed both criminal and civil questions. Judson referred the criminal questions to the U.S. Circuit Court for the District of Connecticut and set a date for the U.S. District Court to hear the sailor's salvage claim. The Judiciary Act of 1789 established both district and circuit courts for the federal judicial system. Among the powers granted to district courts was the authority to hear cases involving maritime commerce and the trade laws of the new nation. Maritime mean water? and trade laws, right? So remember, the, the Moors created a courtroom, knowing law was, it was more common for the Moors to have books than it was for them to have kitchen and stoves. So if you're gonna bring them into a courtroom, I'm just saying maritime law is over water. That's what that yellow fringe in the fucking courtroom mean. They still charging us like we still running on water. In the Amistad case, the Connecticut District Court would be responsible for hearing all property claims related to the ship and its cargo. Circuit courts, which operated from 1789 to 1911, were also trial courts that exercised jurisdiction over most federal crimes, over disputes between citizens of different states, and over all but the smallest cases in which the federal government was a party. They also heard some appeals from the district courts. The circuit court in Connecticut would consider the U.S. attorney's charges of murder and piracy on the Amistad. Circuit courts had no authorized judgeships of their own, so the district judge and the justice of the Supreme Court presided over them. Each of the nine Supreme Court justices was assigned to a regional circuit and spent much of the year traveling to the circuit court sessions in that circuit. This practice was known as circuit riding. The circuit justice for Connecticut was Smith Thompson, a New Yorker appointed to the Supreme Court in 1823 by President James Monroe. During the three weeks between the initial inquest and the sessions of the district and circuit courts, the Amistad case became the subject of a growing national debate on slavery. Led by wealthy merchant Louis Tappan, a group of anti-slavery advocates in New York recognized the opportunity to build national support for the abolition of slavery in the United States. These abolitionists had found the case they were looking for to challenge the laws of slavery in federal court. Tappan and his associates formed a committee to represent the jailed Africans. In a newspaper appeal to Friends of Liberty, they asked for donations in order to employ interpreters, lawyers, and whatever else it took to secure the rights of the Africans. The abolitionist committee called upon Yale College linguistics professor Josiah Gibbs to give the captives a voice in the upcoming court proceedings. Gibbs learned some basic phrases from the captives and then searched the docks of New York 
hoping that an African sailor could serve as a translator. Within a week, Gibbs met two sailors from West Africa's Mendi region, which the abolitionists soon learned was the home of the African captives on the Amistad. While the abolitionists organized their legal strategy, the Spanish ambassador to the United States, signing a treaty between the two countries, requested that the ship and cargo, including the alleged slaves, be returned without any payment for salvage. The administration of President Martin Van Buren decided to enter the Whoa, case on the side. Let's go back. Let's go back. See, it's that quick. That quick, that quick, that quick. While the abolitionists organized their legal strategy, the Spanish ambassador to the United States, signing a treaty between the two countries, requested that the ship and cargo, including the alleged slaves, be returned without any payment for salvage. So there was a treaty between America and whatever this place is. Keep that in mind. So-called place. The administration of President Martin Van Buren decided to enter the case on the side of the Spanish planters and ship owners. Van Buren, a Democrat, faced a difficult bid for re-election in 1840 a and Democrat. was determined not to anger southern slaveholders who supported the Democratic Party. The president preferred to deal with the Amistad as a diplomatic problem and let the Secretary of State, John Forsyth, manage the administration's response to the case. Forsyth instructed the U.S. attorney in Connecticut to take whatever steps were necessary to keep the Africans in federal custody and ready for transfer to Spanish authorities. Preparations for the court proceedings took place against a backdrop of intense public curiosity about the case, and especially about the Mendy captives. Newspapers throughout the country debated questions of federal jurisdiction and the law of piracy. Even popular entertainment capitalized on the interest. Within a few days of the original inquest, a New York theater presented a play called The Long Low Black Schooner. In New Haven, nearly 4,000 visitors paid the jailer for a chance to view the men in custody. The greatest public attention focused on Cinque. The nation's leading African-American newspaper compared Cinque to Senator Daniel Webster, who they hoped would represent him in court. Other papers portrayed Cinque as a classical hero. At the same time, racist newspapers presented vicious accounts of his supposedly savage nature. After the translators arrived in New Haven, newspapers printed articles about the Mendes families, their occupations, and accounts of their enslavement. A broad public soon recognized the men held in custody as distinct individuals devastated by the cruelties of the slave trade. The circuit court convened in the State House in Hartford, Connecticut on September 17, 1839. Sitting in the Senate chamber, the court first impaneled a grand jury to hear testimony regarding the U.S. Attorney's indictment of the Mindy on charges of murder and piracy. When the grand jury asked for instructions from the bench, Circuit Justice Smith Thompson ruled that no federal court had jurisdiction over an act that occurred on a foreign vessel at sea. This ruling eliminated all threat of criminal prosecution of the Africans. Thompson referred the Admiralty case concerning trade and property questions to the U.S. District Court for Connecticut. The Mendy's fate now depended upon a court proceeding that revolved around the question of their status as property rather than any accusation. Boom! It depended on their status, right? So their status as property. So go back to what Taj and we be watching and Taj be talking about how the status of a person. See, Dred Scott's status was wrong. He called himself African. So they were, they had to put their status on the table. So if you don't believe what Taj is talking about with the law and what the Moors be talking about, you tripping. Listen, they, they clearly told you. And if you've been watching me, I've showed y'all multiple videos explaining status in the courtroom. Tin referred the Admiralty case concerning trade and property questions to the U.S. District Court for Connecticut. 
the Mendes' fate now depended upon a court proceeding that revolved around the question of their status as property rather than any accusation of wrongdoing. In the district court, the crew of the Navy ship Washington and the people who traded with the Mendy on the New York shore submitted rival claims for salvage rewards. Both parties asserted that the Mendy were slaves and should be considered part of the Amistad's cargo. Claims for recovery of slave property were submitted by the planters who had purchased the Mendy and by the heirs of the cabin boy Antonio's owner. The U.S. attorney, William Holabird, submitted two different claims in anticipation of two possible decisions of the court. If the court determined that the Mendy were slaves and the property of Spanish planters, the federal government's attorney asserted that they should be delivered to agents of the Spanish government. If the court decided that the Mendy had been illegally enslaved and transported to the United States, the government wanted them delivered to the president for return to their native country under provisions of an anti-slave trade act. In an admiralty proceeding with no jury, determination of the district court case rested solely with Judge Andrew Judson. The abolitionist feared he would not be sympathetic to appeals from Africans. Judson was appointed by President Andrew Jackson in 1836. Prior to that, he was well known for his efforts to shut down a Connecticut school established by abolitionists for the education of African-American girls. Nor were the Mendes lawyers encouraged by the activities of the Van Buren administration. The president ordered the positioning of a Navy ship off the coast of New Haven so that the captives could be removed immediately if the judge ordered their return to Cuba. In New Haven, when Judson convened the district court session in January of 1840, he faced one of the largest crowds ever assembled to view a federal court proceeding. Most of the spectators supported the abolitionists and followed the case so intently that they refused to leave their seats during the midday recesses. The team of experienced lawyers recruited by the abolitionist committee was led by Roger Sherman Baldwin, son of a famous political family. Baldwin and his colleagues followed a legal strategy based on personal liberties and the laws of property. Their priority was to win the court's acknowledgement that slavery violated natural rights, those rights to which every human was entitled regardless of any nation's laws. Baldwin argued that the enslaved Mendy had a natural right to return to their homeland or seek asylum in a free country. But Baldwin... So I ask y'all, if that's the case, right, then at during this time when this case was being passed, don't you think it would have been international law to send back all the Africans they took from Africa to Africa? It, it just so happened, like, think about it. These people, th these particular people who went and stole these slaves from a country came back or so-called came back and then this, it, it caused so much problem because it's against international law. It, it goes back to what I've been saying this whole time. So you got to ask yourself if, if the fact that this, this, you telling me that this one boat out of all of these so-called boats, and I always say that the Europeans are very proud of slavery because it's something they did. It's history. It is history. But we don't got one fucking boat to show us the boats that took us from Africa. We got drones, but they got everything. They got dinosaurs and shit, but you ain't got no boat. That boat ain't that old compared to some of the shit we got in museums. But then you get this one boat that they know came from Africa, and they enslaved these Africans, the so-called Africans, and they enslaved these people or whatever, what do you say, Cuba or whatever they came from, and then all of a sudden, oh, they got rights? Because it could not be done. Because... As it was called naturalization, they had to enslave the people that were on this land already. Also needed to respond to the precedent from an earlier Supreme Court case involving slaves transported by citizens of other nations. In that case, Chief Justice John Marshall wrote the opinion, ruling that even though slavery violated natural law, the federal courts must support the right to hold slave property whenever any government had approved laws in support of slavery or the slave trade. And in the circuit court hearing, Justice Thompson had reminded Baldwin that the... Yo, wow, wow, wow. Look at this shit. Let's go back. 
for the slave trade. Uh, I missed it. I'm gonna show you. You can tell the difference between the people by how they dress. Look at look at the Edward different types Ford, of look at the different types of uh, of so-called slaves they caught. But some of them got fancy clothes. For the right to hold slave property with. A picture worth a thousand words, yo. This is, they took his ass from over there by what we call Mexico. Look at it, right? Look at the different descriptions of where they, wherever they caught them at depends on the style of dress. He got like a colonial joint type dressing on, but these are completely different. Never any government had approved laws in support of Look how he dressed and look how he dressed. That was a free man. Slavery or the slave trade. And in the circuit court hearing. And look at this nigga. It's a black man. Justice Thompson had reminded Baldwin that the United States Constitution protected slavery. Baldwin argued that under Spanish law, the Mendy could not be considered lawfully held slaves. The captives had only recently been transported to Cuba, which was in violation of a Spanish treaty prohibiting the African slave trade. And that under the terms of that Spanish treaty, the Mendy were free in Cuba or any other Spanish territory. Yeah, remember the Haitian Revolution? Yeah, remember with all of the colony, all of, a lot of the islands fought for their freedom. But all of these are called maroon colonies. Check me if I'm lying to you. All of these islands are considered the maroon islands, the maroon colonies. So they were free, but they were more societies. In a trial filled with testimony about salvage laws and treaty obligations, the Especially when you keep talking about these treaties in the 1700s. The treaty was the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. That's the only treaty established on the planet and the oldest treaty that still is standing on the planet. Matic High Point came when Sinke presented the court with a chilling narrative of enslavement. Speaking through a translator, Sinke described his capture by slave traders in West Africa and the horrors of what was called the Middle Passage, the voyage across the Atlantic with several hundred people confined in the suffocating hold of a slave ship. He demonstrated the painful position the enslaved were forced to maintain day and night. Sinke also reenacted the brutal physical scrutiny of the Africans by the planters in the Havana slave market. Two other Mendi captains, Grubo and Fuliwa, gave similar testimony about being kidnapped and enslaved within the past year. After five days of testimony, Judge Judson read his lengthy decision to a crowded courtroom. In response to the conflicting claims of salvage, Judson determined that the naval officers and crew had taken custody of a ship in almost certain danger of sinking, and thus were entitled to an award of one-third the value of the ship and its cargo. But Judson denied a salvage award for rescuing the Africans, because slave sales were illegal in Connecticut, and so the court had no way to determine a monetary value of slaves. The judge then considered Spain's demand for the return of the Mendy as the rightful property of Spanish citizens. According to Judson, the Spaniards' right to this property and with it the fate of the Mendy depended on proof of ownership and proof that the Africans were in fact property under Spanish law. On both points, Judson surprised nearly everyone by ruling against the Spanish claims. Judson determined that the Spanish planters possessed no legal evidence of ownership, only passes for transporting slaves, and that these documents incorrectly stated that the Africans on the Amistad were longtime inhabitants of Spanish territory. The Spanish treaty... So, so if they lied, so if the judge came to the conclusion doing his research that they had no proof that they were ever slaves, that they just lied about where they had got them from, what's the difference in America? Treaty prohibiting the slave trade from Africa declared 
that any Africans transported after 1820 were to be free in Spanish territory, including Cuba. Since the testimony of several witnesses proved that the Mindy had arrived recently in Cuba, Judson declared that they were not lawfully held property and could not be delivered to Spanish officials. Instead, Judson granted the U.S. attorney's alternate request that the Mendy be delivered to the president for transport to their native land. The Mendy were elated at the possibility of returning home, but disappointed that Judson had not declared them free individuals. Judge Judson next turned to the question of Antonio, the slave who had been cabin boy for the Amistad slain captain. The abolitionist wanted... He basically was raping that little boy. ...the court to affirm natural rights and establish a precedent for challenging slavery in the United States. But their hopes collapsed when Judson ruled that because Antonio was born in Spanish territory as a slave, he was the legal property of the captain and must be delivered to the Spanish government along with other Spanish property. Any possible homecoming for the Mendy was postponed when the U.S. Attorney William Holabird appealed to Judson's decision to the U.S. Circuit Court. That court convened in Hartford in April of 1840, with Circuit Justice Smith Thompson presiding. In order to hasten the certain appeal to the Supreme Court, he affirmed the District Court's decision. Pending the convening of the Supreme Court's term in January 1841, the Mendy remained in federal custody, although in less restrictive confines in the town of Westville, outside New Haven. In the coming months, several of them took odd jobs, and all received religious and language instruction provided by the abolitionists. No one could predict how the Supreme Court justices would respond to the Amistad case. The majority of the nine justices were slaveholders, among them Chief Justice Roger Tawney. In the few previous cases dealing with slavery, the Supreme Court had protected the institution as it existed in the United States, but the court had strictly enforced the prohibition on the foreign slave trade. Anticipation about the deliberations were further heightened when former President John Quincy Adams joined the group of lawyers representing the Mendy. The abolitionist committee wanted a prominent statesman on the legal team, and when Daniel Webster declined, they turned to the 73-year-old former president. Adams was then serving as a member of the House of Representatives, where he had earned the nickname Old Man Eloquent for his tireless condemnation of slavery. In February 1841, the case came before the Supreme Court in its chamber on the ground floor of the Capitol building. Large crowds gathered in expectation of dramatic oral arguments. U.S. Attorney General Henry Gilpin presented the government's arguments in support of the Spanish claims to the alleged slaves. And Roger Sherman Baldwin repeated the arguments he had used in the lower courts. Then, former President Adams offered the court and its audience a seven-hour performance over the course of two days. His emotional arguments included a blistering critique of the Van Buren administration. Adams accused the administration of concealing the Spanish demand for return of the captives for trial, which would surely lead to their execution in Cuba. Adams repeatedly invoked the principles of natural rights as embodied in the Declaration of Independence, two copies of which hung before the justices in the Supreme Court chamber. Pause. In that constitution, if you read it, Article, you got Article 6, where it's all talking about where, if you want to know what part of the constitution, go to Article 6, it speaks about, you know what I'm saying, the Moors. Not just all men are created equal. You know what I mean? You got to remember, this is something that's so sick in the mind that nobody's really reading these documents. On March 9th, 1841, nearly 18 months after the federal courts first ordered the detention of the Mendy, Justice Joseph Story delivered his opinion for the majority of the Supreme Court. Story, from Massachusetts, 
was the court's senior justice and the nation's most respected constitutional scholar. After a lengthy review of the federal court proceedings and the arguments presented to the Supreme Court, Story issued the decision that finally gave the captives their unconditional freedom. The Supreme Court upheld the district court's ruling that the Mindy were recently arrived in Cuba and should not be delivered to Spanish officials as legally held property. The justices, however, overturned Judson's decision to deliver the captives to the president for return to Africa. The Supreme Court decision immediately freed the Mindy and released them from federal custody. The victory of freedom was bittersweet. It left the Mindy with no means by which to return to their homeland. To raise money for transportation, the abolitionists staged public appearances at which the Mindy sang, recited from the Bible, and demonstrated their English language skills. One event at the Broadway Tabernacle in New York attracted more than 2,500 people. Finally, in November 1841, the 35 surviving Mindy departed for Sierra Leone, accompanied by several missionaries from the United States. The decision that freed these particular captives offered no legal relief for the nearly 3 million residents of the United States held in slavery. The Supreme Court let stand the district court's ruling that the cabin boy Antonio was a slave under Spanish law, and like all lawfully held slaves, must be returned to his owners. Soon after the decision, Antonio escaped to Canada and freedom, realizing the dreams shared by many slaves in the United States. Yet nothing in the Amistad case would serve as a precedent for legal challenges to slavery within the United States. Until the Civil War, the federal courts continued to protect slave property at the same time that they enforced laws prohibiting the slave trade from Africa. Because they fucking slaves never came from Africa in the first place. And abolitionists largely abandoned efforts to challenge slavery through the federal judiciary. Like many other important cases in the history of the federal courts, Amistad had its greatest impact in the world beyond courtrooms and casebooks. The legend of Sinke inspired other enslaved people and remains a powerful... T the shit that killed me is that it sounds like it's a black man narrating this, but only that one time at the beginning when they said his name was Sing Bay, and then they said better known as Sinke, and he never said it again. His name is Sing Bay. He was a Moor. Day Bay El El Ali. It's the five names, and his name was Sing Bay. He was a Moor. Hail of the quest for freedom. The widely reported court proceedings exposed the fragile legal principles and political compromises supporting slavery. And the, and then also they said that when they when he when they was in court that they got him that the lawyer learned a couple of words and languages from them. So and then he went back to the river or back to the bank of the Connecticut to find him some black sailors. And he found the black sailors he found came from the same homeland as they did. So clearly they were sailors that were taken. Cause he even told them like, yo, take his faces back in the direction of where the sunset knowing that where Africa is. Personal stories of enslavement won the anti-slavery cause many new supporters. The lasting impact of Amistad's passage through the federal courts was to encourage the growing opposition to slavery in the United States. I want you to remember that Amistad never said he was black. B.A. Yeah.